Hey everyone, it's Matt here with Night Run Studio, and in this video, we're gonna get our hero firing arrows. I'm gonna break this one into two parts. The first video will do all the functional stuff and will actually get you set up with your bow and arrow. And the second video will be polished, including animations and that sort of thing. This video is part of my action RPG series, but if you're just joining us now, don't worry. The system is designed to be pretty adaptable and should work with whatever custom scripts you've got in your project. Let's get started. Now, first things first, we wanna create our arrow. I'm using the Tiny Swords Asset Pack and it comes with an arrow graphic. So I'm just gonna grab that and drag it right into my hierarchy. This one, I'll just go to scene view, double click the arrow to zoom in on it, and I'm just gonna move it over in front of my character. Let's add a rigid body 2D to give this some physics and we're just gonna take off the gravity so that it doesn't drop, which would look kind of funny in a four directional map. I'm also gonna add a box collider 2D and just edit the size of the collider here so that it's a little larger than the shaft of the arrow. That just gives the player the benefit of the doubt so that on a near miss, the player still gets the hit. I'm also just gonna move the box forward a little so that the arrow can actually go into objects a little bit before it stops. With that done, we're ready to get coding. So I'm just gonna go to my assets folder into scripts and head to my player scripts. I'll just right click and I'm gonna call this first one arrow. I'm gonna begin by getting rid of the update method as we're not gonna be needing that one. And then we just need to make some variables. First off, we need a public reference to our rigid body. I'll call this RB. We're also gonna need a vector two, which will be the direction the arrow fires. I'm gonna start mine off as oriented to the right since that's the direction my player is facing. Additionally, we'll need a public float, which will be the lifespan. I'm gonna go with two seconds, though we can change this later in the inspector, as well as another public float for our speed. With all that set up, we can head down into start, and all we wanna do is give our arrow a push as soon as it comes into the game. To do this, we'll tell our rigid body that its new velocity should be equal to direction times speed. And here we're just drawing the direction and speed from our variables up top. We're also gonna tell it that we want it to destroy itself, so we'll put destroy game object. But if we add a comma, we can then say how long we want it to wait before it does this. And we just want it to wait for its lifespan, two seconds to pass. That's all we need to be able to run our first test. So back in Unity, I'm just gonna click on the arrow and add the arrow script. I'm gonna make sure to drag my rigid body into the RB box, give it some speed. Let's start off by trying three, which will be nice and slow so we can track it. Now, when I get in the game, you'll see that it is in fact moving forward and after two seconds, it destroyed itself. Now that we've got basic arrow functionality, I wanna make it so we can actually shoot the arrow. I'm gonna create a new script and similar to the convention we used for player underscore combat, we'll call this one player underscore bow. Before we start writing the script, let's set a couple things up ahead of time. I'm gonna click on my player and add the player bow script. Then I'm gonna open them up and similar to how we used an attack point earlier to determine the area where our attack would initiate, we're gonna create an empty here, call it launch point, And this is the point at which the arrow will originate when firing. I'm just gonna drag it out in front of my player a little bit so that we don't have it bouncing into him. Now, right off the bat, I'm gonna get rid of my start method and we're just gonna add two variables. The first will be the transform we just created, the launch point. And the second one is going to be a game object. We'll call this arrow prefab. And this is just so we know what we're shooting. Now, rather than put a bunch of logic in update, I'm actually gonna create a shoot method, which will just allow us to separate the different concerns of our code and keep things more readable. So I'll just type in shoot here. And then down below, we're gonna create a public void method called shoot. I'm making this one public because later on we're gonna need access to it from an external script. So in here, we're going to, as soon as shoot is called, instantiate the arrow prefab. We want it to appear at the launch point's position. And finally, we don't need any special rotation at this point, so we're just gonna put quaternion.identity, which will keep the arrow from rotating and just put it in the game at zero. This brings us to another testable point, so let's click on the player. Make sure that his launch point is dragged into that box so he knows where to fire the arrow from. And finally, we just need to make a prefab. I have a folder here in my assets called prefabs and I'm just gonna drag the arrow in there. With that done, we can delete arrow from our scene and just use the prefab. Let's make sure to attach that to our player and then we can have some fun. Now when we get in the game, it is go time. The arrows are deleting themselves after two seconds, but obviously we need some sort of a mechanism so this doesn't happen. So we definitely need to make it so we only fire on an actual button press. So before we get into our script, let's create that button. We're gonna to go to edit, project settings, and then head over to our input manager. Here we're just gonna open up our axes and we need to pick a place to put our shoot 
If you haven't yet used Fire 1, 2, or 3, I would recommend using one of those as the button you rename. I've already used those for other things, so I'm just going to click on Secondary Attack here, and I'm going to rename this one to Shoot. I'm going to make my character shoot with the J button. All right, so now we can head down into our update method, and before we send out a call to the shoot method, let's just add an if statement. In this case, let's check if there's an input, which is a get button down, and in this case, we're looking for the shoot button. Now, while we're here, let's also add some directionality. So let's head up top where we're going to make a vector2 called aim direction. And again, I'm going to start off with vector2 right, since that's the orientation of my arrow at the beginning. Before I pressed any button, I want it to shoot to the right. So now we just need to take in a direction that we're aiming at and then pass that information along to the arrow so it can orient itself. I'm going to head down into update where we're going to handle aiming and once again just make a separate method to keep our code nice and clean. This one can be a private void method called handle aiming. Now here we're going to do something similar to what we did in our movement script to get our direction presses for what way the player should move. We're going to make a local float called horizontal which will just be based on an input, which is get axis raw horizontal. So we'll store that value. We'll then do the same thing for vertical, storing it in this vertical float. Now we're only going to want to store one of these directions if the player is actually moving, as when we stop pushing a button and those inputs are zero, we don't want him to reset his direction to a vector to zero, in which case the arrow would have no directionality at all. So we'll just make an if statement here. And if horizontal is not zero, or vertical is not zero, meaning we're pressing at least one of those buttons, then we'll take in our inputs. And in that case, we'll set our aim direction to be equal to a new vector, which will just be a mixture of the horizontal and vertical values. Now we're also going to normalize these. That just sets them to a magnitude of one. Now we just need to pass this information along to the arrow itself. I'm going to come down into my shoot method, and before we instantiate, we're going to actually make a reference to our arrow script. We'll call that reference arrow, and it's going to be equal to the instantiated object. The cool thing about this is it allows us to instantiate, but also store a reference to the object that we are instantiating. We do need to add a get component arrow at the end in order to fill that. Now we can just use that keyword arrow in order to send messages. So we're just going to go arrow dot, and over here you can see in our arrow we've got this direction variable. So we can just put dot direction is equal to aim direction. Now, as soon as we instantiate the arrow, it will automatically get the direction that we are currently aiming. All right, make sure to save that, and now when we get in the game, we can shoot, and the arrow does in fact go in the direction that we're facing. Mine are a little slow, so my player's actually bumping into them after he shoots them, but you can kind of see that it's sort of working properly. All right, now before I forget, I'm going to just add a speed to this prefab of more like eight, so the next time I test, it moves a little more reasonably. Then we can head back into our arrow script. Next up, I want to get our arrow rotating so it looks a little better in the game. To do this, we're going to go into start, and right after we set its velocity, we're going to call a new method called rotate arrow. We then can create that private void method, and inside of here, we need to first of all calculate the angle to rotate. To do this, we'll make a float called angle, and we're going to use two formulas here. The first is a math function called atan2, and it will calculate in radians the angle that we need, Unfortunately, radians don't do us much good in terms of setting our rotations, so we then need to use a second math function called rad to degree, which will just turn it from radians into regular degrees. Now we can use those degrees to actually rotate our arrow. So we're just going to directly tell the arrow's transform that its rotation should be equal to, and here we're going to put quaternion.euler, and this just essentially allows us to input the degrees we just did and apply them to our rotation. So inside of the brackets now, we're going to make a new vector 3. As rotation, we need to access the z value, not just the x and y. Now we're not going to do anything to the x or y, so we can put zeros, and we'll just put our angle we just calculated on the z. All right, with all that out of the way, we can now fire arrows in whatever direction we're facing. You'll notice when they come in, they are in fact facing the correct direction, and they're rotated appropriately. Of course, my player is still kind of bumping into them and twisting them around, which is causing some funny interactions, but it's working more or less. If you want at this point, you could go into your rigid body, and under constraints, we could freeze the Z rotation, which will just make it so that they don't spin around anymore. Though you might actually want this as it's kind of fun to watch them ricochet into things, so I'll let you choose. As you can see, that change cleans things up pretty nicely, though of course we can spam the button. So let's add a cooldown. Now, in our player bow script, we're just going to create two variables. The first will be a private float. Actually, let's make that a public float called shoot cooldown. And I'm just going to start mine off at half a second. We'll then make a private 
float, this time I mean private, which will be our shoot timer, which will just keep track of the cooldown's current value. Down in our update method, we'll just make sure the shoot timer is always going down, so we'll subtract time.delta time. Then we'll just make sure that we can only shoot if we're pushing the shoot button, and if the shoot timer has in fact gotten to zero or lower. We can then come down to our shoot method and just make sure that after shooting, we set that shoot timer to equal the shoot cooldown, which will just reset that cooldown. All right, with that done, we've now got it so that we can spam the button all we want, but we only fire an arrow every half second. They're still a little slow, which is especially on the diagonal why that looks funny, but we're getting close. All right, so the final thing we're going to do for this video is add some damage and knockback. Now, if you've not been following along with the entire series, the next part might be just a little different from you, though it is relatively universal. What we just need to do is find out where your enemy takes damage. In my case, that's in my enemy health script through this change health method which just simply takes in an integer, which is how much damage it should be taking. I also have an enemy knockback script, which has this knockback method where I just pass along some information about the force and length of knockback and that sort of thing, and it then applies the knockback. If you want to, you can go back and check out those videos to see how exactly we've accomplished all of this. So the first thing we need to do here is actually recognize when we've hit an enemy. To do this, we're going to move away from a tag method, which is probably the most common, and use something that's just a little bit more performant, which is using layers. So we're going to make a public layer mask up at the top here called enemy layer, which will just allow us to pick whatever layers we want to be considered enemies and select them in the inspector. From here, we're going to create a on collision enter 2D method, which will fire any time the arrows hit any object with a collider. When they do that, we want to do a check to see if the object they've hit is of the layer that matches our enemy layer. To do this, we're just going to type enemy layer dot value, which will convert our enemy layer mask we just made into binary for easy comparison. We'll then use a bitwise operator to do the same thing to our collision game objects layer. The one with the arrows is for shifting the one over in order to create binary. We can then quickly compare to see if the collision game objects layer overlaps with our enemy layer. If so, we'll run the next line of code. So if we do find that the object we've hit overlaps with our enemy layer, we want to deal some damage. So we're going to talk to the collision game object that we just hit, and we're going to look on it to see if it has an enemy health component. If it does, we're going to call that change health method. Now this is giving an error because it wants us to pass in how much health to change it by. And here I'm just going to put negative damage rather than giving a specific hard-coded number, and that'll allow us to come up top and create a public integer variable called damage so that we can give the arrows different amounts for different arrows and reuse this script. Now knockback will work very similar to how we're dealing damage, except that it just needs a little more data. So let's pop into our enemy knockback script to see how we've set it up. Now this one is set up to take in information from our player's melee attack. So currently the transform it's expecting is the player's transform so that it can tell what direction to be knocked back. In this case, we want it to work for the player or the arrow, so let's just change it to force transform, which is just a more logical name, as it's the object exerting force on our enemy. Now the way this knockback method works is that it takes in our force transform in order to calculate the direction that it needs to travel. It also runs things like our stun and the amount of time that the knockback lasts. So to call this, let's head into our arrow script. We're just going to go collision game object. We're going to look for the enemy knockback component, if it has it, we'll call knockback. And now at this point, we just want to pass in the transform of our arrow so we can type transform. Now we just need to create some variables so we know how powerful this arrow is. Let's create a public float called knockback force, how hard to hit the enemy. Another public float called knockback time, which is how long he will be in motion before he snaps to a stop. And finally, a public float called stun time, which is how long he'll be dazed at the end of the knockback. Then we can just come back into our on collision method and just add in those three pieces of information. Now back in Unity, we're going to need to click on our enemy and make sure that he's actually on the enemy layer. We can click on layer here, and if you don't already have an enemy layer, be sure to add layer, put in an et one for enemy, and then make sure that you apply that to all of your enemies. I've actually got a bunch here in my enemies drop down, and I'm just going to shift click them all and set them all to be on the enemy layer. Next, I'm going to open up my arrow prefab by double-clicking it. Make sure that it knows that the enemy layer includes enemies. Later on, you can add other things if there's other things your player will be able to attack and deal damage to. I'm just going to give it two damage for now. Let's give it a knockback force of 10. I'm going to make my knockback last for about half a second, and we'll just make the stun last for one second. 
Let's click this arrow here to get out of the prefab. Now when we get in the game, we can fire arrows at will and they will in fact send the enemy flying backwards. And if we hit him enough times, he will take enough damage that he's destroyed. All right, for the most part, that's working well. Obviously, we've got some problems with floaty arrows that we would rather see them get buried in the object that they're hitting. And we've also got some work to do in terms of adding animations to our player, as well as this strange offset where when we fire, the bullets kind of seem to jerk a little bit away from the player and not quite fire straight on. We'll get to all that in the next video where we do some polish. I hope to see you in that one. Until then, this is Matt with Nightrun Studio. Cheers.